Welcome to this episode of the We Travel There podcast. We're in Paris, France with my new friend Jay Swanson of Paris in My Pocket. Jay was born in the U.S. but always wanted to live in France. He traveled to Nice to teach English and fell in love with Paris on a weekend trip. After his teaching gig was up, he returned home for a few years before moving to Paris permanently in 2017. He loves the Paris lifestyle, walkability, and the culture. In this episode, Jay and I talk about attending the Nuit Blanche Annual Contemporary Art Festival, watching the sunrise at Sacre Coeur, and seeing the fireworks from the Eiffel Tower on Bastille Day. You hear about these three amazing experiences and so much more. If you know someone interested in visiting France, I'd love it if you shared this episode with them. The show notes and our one-page guide to Jay's tips are available at wetravelthere.com forward slash Paris. Now let's get started. The We Travel There podcast helps you travel like a local by interviewing guests from around the world to uncover the hidden gems of their city by finding out the best things to do, eat, drink, and see from a local's point of view. Whether I'm traveling for business or pleasure, it's important to have clothes that make me look good and feel great. I wear Bluffworks jeans, slacks, dress shirts, and blazers because they're wrinkle-free and are designed for the modern traveler. And if they get dirty, a quick spin in the washing machine, and they're good as new. Go to wetravelthere.com forward slash bluffworks for a special offer and select from the latest styles so you can stay wrinkle-free when you travel. Hey, Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Right on. So today we're talking about Paris, France, and... Before we start recording, I was telling the story about the first time I went to Paris. And actually, I haven't shared this, but my daughter has been dying to go to Paris. And I, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to book that trip for us later this year. And so basically, like, make her dreams come true. So it, it's actually really timely that you're going to be on the show and sharing all these amazing tips. So that way, I have some really cool ideas for, for our upcoming trip. I'm going to do everything I can to help you impress your daughter. Don't worry. Nice. Well, she has high expectations. So. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, just <laughs> You're eight year olds with the high expectations. You yeah. gotta watch out. <laughs> so, you know, obviously people can listen and, and hear your voice. You don't sound French. What's your connection to Paris and like how long have you been there? I may not sound French, but I'm on the verge of becoming French, actually. I just uh I finished my naturalization documentation recently. And so now I'm in the limbo of waiting for who knows how long. So we'll find out soon. Um, but yeah, I was born and raised in the US, Washington State, Pullman, Washington, for anybody from the Northwest who would know where that was a long throw away from Seattle for everybody else. And I just always really wanted to come to France. I have no idea why. Just ever since I was a kid, I was like, I'm going to France. And so I learned French in high school and then studied it in college and then got here. And I actually went to Nice first to teach English as an assistant. I got there and I was like, I think I might've made a mistake. I don't, what am I doing here? Like I just, it was fine. It was good for my language, but I didn't really get it. And then I came to Paris on like my last week in France and I immediately fell in love and it became my, my life's mission to get back here. And so that that's ultimately a few more steps along the way, but that's ultimately how I ended up with my destiny in in Paris. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. I mean, I know you're heavily into Instagram and we'll talk about your, your profile and, and your social media reach a little bit later, but it's like that meme that, you know, that you see on, on Instagram now, it's like, you know, you're five seconds into the place and you're like, you know, I could live here. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Within, within, I mean, just almost instantaneously, which is funny because when I first got here, I did land in Paris and then take a train to Nice. And it was so overwhelming when I first got here because I I was a small town kid. I'd never really been to that big of a city before. And obviously the narrow streets and just the the crowds in certain areas, especially around train stations and stuff, it was just chaos. And I, I didn't know what to make of it. And I spent the whole day dragging my bag around trying to find this hostel. And it got, this is back like when you had to print your directions from MapQuest. And so like, here I am lost in the wrong part of town. And eventually I was like, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to, I'm just going to head, I'm going to head to Nice. I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> so my first, my very first experience with Paris was completely different. It was, I think after I had, you know, gotten used to the, the lifestyle a little bit, the language. And then when I came to Paris, then I was very much ready for, I was very much ready for it to strike me. Nice, nice. Now, obviously, like you said, you learned French in, in school, and then obviously you learned even more when you're there, you know, kind of teaching English and everything. For people who are planning to visit Paris, how much French do they need to know? Uh, I know when we went, like, it was helpful to my wife. Uh, she knew a few words here and there. But for the average tourist, like, how much French do you need to know when you're when you're visiting Paris? Yeah, I mean, I think, for one, I think you should, everybody listening should take a breath. It's going to be okay. Don't have to speak very much French at all. If you don't speak any French, you're, I'm, I'll teach you how to act your way through it. Because you'd be surprised how far you can get with pointing and grunting. But after the pointing and grunting fails, I would just try to make an effort 
first of all, especially if your your audience is mostly American, let's use our indoor voices, even when we're outdoors. That's a good first step. And then the second step would be to just graciously say bonjour. Whenever you walk into anywhere, the magic word is always bonjour, which means hello. And if you walk into any store, restaurant, bakery, cafe, just starting with that will change your life because I think a lot of Americans are unaware of the, the you know, it's just a bit of the ritual. When you're walking into somebody's restaurant, you're walking into the extension of their home. It's where the word chez comes from, right? Like chez Jean or something like that. And a lot of French restaurants, chez actually means home. So you're, the name of a restaurant, if it's like chez Juliette, it means Juliette's home. And so there's a bit of a culture around that. When you're walking in, you are a guest in their home and it's only polite to introduce yourself, to to announce yourself by saying bonjour. And once you've said that, then the grunting and pointing can start. But, um, <laughs> you know, like holding up two fingers to say how many people you are and, you know, if you're going to eat and so forth. Um, but bonjour is the most important thing. And then if you can go so far as to learn how to say, do you speak English, which would be parlez-vous anglais, also fairly easy. Those are enough to get you going because the way you say bonjour is going to give away that you don't speak French probably pretty quickly. And if that doesn't give you away, whatever comes up next will. So just putting in that effort of like trying will ingratiate you to your host. And you'll be surprised how many of them speak enough English to help you get to where you're going. Absolutely. Yeah. As soon as they hear you say bonjour, they're going to be like, you're not from around these parts, are you, boy? Yeah. They're you know? like, oh, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> Now, like you said, like, you know, you, you realize that you kind of found your place when you, when you came back to Paris after being in Nice, like if you had to describe like the people or the city in just a couple of words, how would you do that? Uh, it's, I'm really trying hard not to, to lay on the thick jokes right now. Cause of course I was going to say like aggressive, obnoxious. No, the reality is that they are that sometimes actually Paris. One of the good things that Paris has given me is it's helped me to grow a backbone because people here will let you know what they think. And I think that's just city living in some ways, but man, I've grown a lot by living in this city. But I think one of the things I was actually thinking about this today, the Parisians in general get a really bad rap for being rude or being, uh, you know, just like gruff, sour, complaining and all that. But I think it's actually changed a lot, especially in the last decade. The culture has shifted a fair amount. There's a lot more openness, a lot more warmth. People are actually very friendly and very helpful. It's kind of just knowing how to navigate a little bit at the beginning. And then I, I find that Parisians in particular are actually a very welcoming group of people. They're not good at small talk, so don't expect that. But man, if you get lost and you need some help, you will be surprised at how quickly people jump to help. Wow, that's great. Yeah, like when I went there, everybody was very welcoming. The only time I had that one problem that I explained to you earlier was like when I went to McDonald's by the Louvre. Other than that, everybody was fantastic. That McDonald's, man. Got to avoid that one in particular. <laughs> Absolutely. So when people are planning their trip to come to Paris, I know uh, normally like we focus on things being very evergreen and lasting for many, many years, but I know Paris is actually going to be a, a big destination this summer for the Olympics, right? You know, when we went, we actually went kind of like that shoulder season, like end of April, beginning of May, because we were using miles and like that was like when everything was much cheaper. But when somebody is planning their trip to Paris, so when would you recommend them come in to visit? I mean, I always say to come in May or September. Because it depends on what you're looking for. If you want to have the city as much to yourself as possible, January is great because the holidays have passed. Most of the tourists that came for that are gone. A lot of the Parisians haven't come back yet from vacation. The streets are very quiet, but it is very cold. So that is the drawback. May and September have the best weather, but May is where the tourist season is starting to ramp up a little bit. And September, you might get caught in a little bit of the after effects of everyone going on vacation in August. Those are still my favorites. And actually, the, the best part about traveling in the rest of France in September is that when the Parisians are on vacation in August, they've all gone back to school by September. So you're, you're competing with a lot fewer families, especially if you're a family traveling. September is going to be a lot better than, say, August, where a lot of people avoid Paris in August because it empties out. Everybody goes on vacation. But being in, in Paris in August can be great if you are aware that a lot of stuff's going to be closed. Outside of that, it's pretty calm and, and fun. But then September, traveling the rest of the country is definitely the time to do it because everybody's back to school and have has had their vacation. So they're probably in a friendlier mood and you're just ready to do it. <laughs> That's really good. And no, actually, one thing, when you, speaking of closures, I didn't realize this because obviously I'm American and you know, we don't always pay attention to everything going in, on in other countries. But we showed up around the end of April and we were going to try to take a taxi. Actually, we were going to go out to the beaches of Normandy and everything like that. We didn't realize things were shut down on May 1st for May Day. Yeah. 
And so that was a, uh, that really threw our plans for a loop. And so if you are planning kind of like the end of April, beginning of May time period, keep in mind that a lot of things are closed on, on May 1st. That's good. Well, and also I would say a lot of stuff still catches me off guard because I'm self-employed. So I'm not on a regular vacation schedule with everybody else. And then there are just a lot of, a lot more holidays here than in the States. And so there are just days where I walk outside and I'm like, did I miss Sunday? Like, is it, what ha- <laughs> like, where is everybody? And so a tip that I could give there would be to look up like the French, I guess you'd call it the French holiday calendar or like whatever the, it's a jour férié in French. But if you go and you look at that and you see what days things are going to be closed down, that'll help to prevent you from getting totally cut off guard. Ah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Now, speaking of the calendar, what type of uh, annual events should people consider when they're when they're planning their trip to Paris? So that's actually a really good follow up because what I would say, if you want to be here when the city is the liveliest, barring the Olympics, would be June. June has everything going on. You have my favorite event of the year, which is Fête de la Musique. It's on the solstice. Every street corner, well, not every, but you know what I mean. Like every street corner turns into a little mini concert. So every bar, cafe, there's just anything from like small, like two dudes with the guitars playing all the way up to like basically raves down side streets. It's just music everywhere. It's amazing. It's one of my, it's just one of my favorite, favorite nights of the year. But you also then have Pride that month, which the Pride Parade is usually a really, really fun experience. And everyone is obviously welcome to that. That's really fun. And then you also have Nuit Blanche, which is when a whole bunch of different venues around the city convert themselves into kind of like mini museums and experiences late at night. So you actually go out over the, the night. Nuit Blanche means the, the white night and not, not like a white night on a horse, but like nighttime after evening time. And it's amazing. Like you never know what you're going to stumble into. You can definitely look up in advance what's going to be happening where, but I've always found it to be an evening full of surprises. So June is a really, really cool time. That is amazing. It's just like part of the whole reason for traveling is finding those unique experiences that you can't find at home and having something like that, that is even out of the ordinary, what you think of when you're thinking of Paris, that that would definitely be something that you'd want to plan your trip around. Oh, absolutely. I think another one that's, that you would never imagine is everybody's aware of the the national day, the Fête Nationale on uh, the 14th of July, right? Bastille Day. For one, nobody calls it Bastille Day here, just so that you're aware. They just call it the 14th. But the night before the 14th, on the 13th, all over the city is the Bal des Pompiers, which is the, the firefighters ball. And all the firefighters, not all of them, but a, a variety. I'm using a lot of superlatives here, but all of the firefighters organize themselves so that a certain number of fire stations actually get turned into nightclubs the night before. And so you can go to these fire stations. It's free to enter. You end up buying beer directly from the firefighters. They end up raising money that way, I think, somehow. And it is crazy. It's actually a really, really fun party. You just have to put up with the line to get in. But then if you've ever thought, what would it be like to go dancing all night in a fire station in Paris? You can have your answer one night of the year. <laughs> that is so amazing. Right. And well, speaking of some of the other best things to do in Paris, uh, obviously we know about the Louvre. We know about Eiffel Tower, you know, Arc de Triomphe and Moulin Rouge that are iconic, but also there's a lot of things that I think from a, a local's perspective that are often overlooked. So what are some of the things that you recommend us do when we're there in Paris that we might not think about? Uh, I think one that's an overlap that a lot of people are more aware of, but that is still very worth going to would be the Atelier des Lumières, which is, it's, they've actually spread it all over the world now. You can go to uh, exhibitions in a lot of different cities, but basically it's a warehouse that they converted into a living painting. So when you walk in, they're projecting the artwork of different artists from different epochs on the walls. And it's it's a it's an immersive show. So to music and everything else, they animate a lot of very famous works And you can go and sit for an hour and see one or two different artists depicted, depending on what tickets you buy and when you go in. It's a fantastic way to get out of the heat in the summer, like because it's air conditioned. It's also a good way to get warm in the winter. If things are a little bit cold, you get inside, you get to see something really unique. And it's it's always been where I've never regretted going. Like I would say there are certain sites in the city that I you can't pay me to go back to because I've been there too many times. But like that's one of those ones that I'm really actually happy to just go sit for an hour anytime. That's a really good one. That is really cool. Like speaking of like just going and sitting, like I don't go to church too often. Like, you know, I have my beliefs and everything like that. But like one of the things that was like one of the most profound experiences that I have uh, when I was there was actually going into the the church of Notre Dame and just sitting there and, and admiring the artwork, admiring 
the people that are there and everything like that. But obviously it was in the news that the, you know, it kind of burnt down and, you know, like the, the roof and everything, but I understand it's almost like rebuilt. And I think parts of it have like reopened, right? So nothing's reopened yet, but they're planning to have it reopened by the end of the year. I saw a couple different reports and I think they're going to try and make it a little bit more accessible by the time the Olympics roll around, but it won't be fully open until uh, the end of 2024, beginning of 2025. Surprisingly, they've actually done it. They're staying very close to their timeline, despite uh, some pretty severe hangups along the way. So my alternatives for that, though, because the odds are good if anybody's coming. If Yeah, if you're coming, speaking of Evergreen, once the church is open, Notre Dame, 100% worth it. Even if it looks like there's a long line to get in, the lines usually are very quick. Guys, take off your hats. Ladies generally cover your shoulders. I don't think they care about that as much anymore. And then, you know, obviously respect whatever service is going on inside. Again, indoor voices, library voices at that state. But Notre Dame is one of my favorite places to go. I, you know, back before the fire, I used to go in probably once a week, once once every couple of weeks. Just if I was walking by, I would detour to go through it because there's something about walking through Notre Dame that helps you to feel like you are in Paris because it's been standing there longer than almost any other building in the city and has been the heart of the city for a very long time. Despite the fact that French is now France is, you know, a secular culture, that church still definitely holds a very strong place in the national identity. And you really feel it when you're walking through the columns. It's beautiful. But if you're here before it reopens, Sacre Coeur will give you a little bit of that. It's a much newer church. It's only I think 150 years old. So it's not that old. It may even be younger than the Eiffel Tower. I don't remember. I need to, I should look up the date. But the other one that I think is overlooked all the time is Saint Etienne du Mont. And Saint Etienne du Mont is just behind the Pantheon. So if you go to the Pantheon and you stand directly in front of it, to your left, you'll see this little kind of like asymmetrical mysterious building back in the in the, to the left hand side go around and get in there and it, it's incredible it's it's this beautiful little church that has the remains of saint genevieve in it so she's the patron saint of paris and when i say remains i mean like kind of like what is left of her after they actually burned and threw her body in the river during the revolution so don't hold that don't hold your standards <laughs> life for the relics on that front but it's a beautiful church it's super underrated and often completely looked over and missed and so I would I would highly recommend going in there to get your fix for sure. And when you mentioned the the Church of Sacre Coeur, one thing that I loved about it was one just being able to walk through all the streets yeah. on the way up there. And I, you know, this is something that you got be prepared for a little bit of a walk because it is up. It's sitting up on top of a hill, and you're walking through the streets and maybe stop at a cafe and and have a drink and or just sit and enjoy the the views. But also once you get up to the Sacre Coeur, obviously inside is really wonderful, but also out on the the balcony out there, you can have just amazing views of all of Paris from like up on that hill. hundred percent. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's one of the best, fan- it's an amazing vantage point for sunrise too. If you're, if you're an early riser, getting up there to watch the sunrise is really amazing. And if anyone listening is less mobile and a hill sounds like that's out for you, there is, I always mispronounce this word, but there's a funiculaire and it's basically, I, I would want to call it like, it's a mix between an escalator and a gondola, but there is a two car system that will take you up like 70, 80% of the hill. So you just have to walk to the base of the hill to the left of the park. You'll see that there. It'll take you up for the same cost as a Metro ticket. And then you'll be almost all the way up there. You'll just have to go up one more set of stairs to get into the church. Right on. Well, we only have a few more minutes and I want to talk about a couple of other things here. First off, like obviously when we fly there, France is part of the EU, so it's pretty easy to get in if you have an American passport. Uh, right now there's no fee, but they're actually getting ready to implement an e-visa, but I think that's been pushed off to 2025. They've been pushing that thing off for years and years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so luckily there's no fee there. Uh, again, you have that passport. It's easy to get in anywhere in the EU. So that's great. When you're actually paying for things, do you recommend people get euros or, or French francs? Uh, or is it something that just using your credit card is going to get handle most everything for you? Yeah, your credit card will get get you most everywhere. Um, if you have if you have a credit card that has no international transaction fees, that's really really easy. My dad does that whenever he's here. And then if you do want to convert or you would like to get what could be a better rate, full disclosure, they are a former sponsor of mine, but I love them to death, and they won't pay me anymore. So I feel like me telling you about them <laughs> is as pure as it gets. Wise, formerly transfer wise, you can open an account with them. 
the card that you carry with them, whether on your phone or physically, uh, will convert whatever currency you need instantaneously if your accounts are happening to run low and their rates are wildly competitive. So I use them, honestly, I use them day to day. It just they're my, my number one bank anyways at this point, just for anything. And, but then when you're traveling, they make everything super easy. Nice. And then also, uh, as we're going around and, and getting through seeing all these different attractions, and we're going to talk about some different food places here in a minute, do we need to rent a car? Do we take public transportation? Like, What's the best way to get around from, from your perspective? Do not rent a car. Uh, you will hate your life so much if you rent a car in Paris. The city is actively trying to, to discourage car traffic as well. So if you would like to sit in Parisian traffic and see what that's like, it is an experience and you're more than welcome to give it a try. The public transportation here is amazing. But even more than that, walking around the city is one of the best parts of visiting Paris. Just the ability to walk. It's a, such a walkable city. You can cross most of it on foot with no problem. I would definitely recommend that before you visit, you get your steps up. So take your daughter out for long walks ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> make sure that you're getting your 10, 15,000 steps in and everybody's good to go. But once you're here, if you ever need to hop from A to B, you know, the metro, I love the metro system. Super easy. The buses are also very easy to access and they'll get you all the way across town. But then it's not one of those cities where like you just want to go to a particular neighborhood or, you know, there's only one part of town that's beautiful. The, I would say like 80% of the surface area of Paris, if not 90% of it, is worth just wandering and exploring on its own. And so just going for a stroll is probably one of the top three things to do in Paris, which I think says a lot. So if you rent a car, don't say I didn't tell you so. The only reason I would do that is to get out of the city, like to go to the beaches or something like that. Otherwise, yeah, man, just walk, walk in Metro and bike. If you're brave enough, I would definitely bike around the city as well. Nice. Yeah. Well, when we, uh, when we were there, like I said, we went out to the beaches of Normandy. We rented a car and coming back in, first off, I could not find a gas station anywhere in the city. It's really hard. And so I was like totally stressed out trying to return the car without them charging me $13 a, a gallon for gas, right? Then I got stuck in the in the loop at the Arc de Triomphe. And all I can think of was like Chevy Chase and National Lampoon's Vacation. You're getting stuck near Big Ben, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's all I can think of, man. Because, I mean, it is absolutely crazy. The cars just jutting in and out, you know, motorcycles, you're cutting it off everybody. It is hectic. It is. It's nuts. But you'll think I'm crazy because I actually ride my bike through that roundabout all the time. Oh, God. I love it. <laughs> we'll, we'll pray for you. you know? <laughs> I appreciate it. I'll take it. <laughs> well, also one of the things, obviously, we haven't talked about yet is... What are some of the best hotels in Paris? I, I know I did a little research. Uh, one of my partners is a ways. They help us book award travel, maximizing our, our miles and points. And I found a couple of great ones that really stood out to me. Uh, the Park Hyatt is an amazing property, 45,000 points a night, uh, which is a lot for, for Hyatt points. But that hotel is $1,500 a night. Wow. So it's a great way to be able to kind of maximize the value of your points by, by staying at something like that. I bet you it's like nine grand a night during the Olympics. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and then also like the the Hilton uh, Le Belle Grand, 80,000 points, which is not a lot for Hilton points versus $542. So that's a pretty good deal. Uh, and so there's a lot of great, great opportunities there. And we'll have links to that in, in the show notes. But where do you recommend people stay? I, I know in some of the notes you provided to me that there's kind of like concentric circles around the city and those circles kind of help dictate like what prices are and, and, and how your, your Metro passes work. Right. Uh, yeah. So basically the way that I would think I would definitely recommend. So I'm, I full disclosure, I'm not a hotel expert cause I don't stay in hotels in Paris and I try to only recommend the things that I know. The Huxton is definitely a fun spot and their bar is cool. And like, there are places around town that are really fun. A lot of really fun boutique hotels, your listeners being more interested in points, I used to be in the points game back in the day uh, when I was flying around the States, but like I'm way out of it. So definitely not the most useful there. But I would say that if you're going to stay in the city for one, yes, on the concentric circle side, especially if it's your first time in Paris, you definitely want to stay within what we call the peripherique, which is the ring road around Paris. That's going to be what is considered Paris proper or central Paris for the greater Paris region. And technically it is the city limit for Paris itself. 
But then for, for first timers, for sure, I would say you want to stay in probably the first six, one of the first six or seven arrondissements. months. The more central you are, the better, the closer to Notre Dame as well as a, as a kind of just a landmark to reach out for. That's also a really good starting point. The fourth, fifth, and sixth, I think are great places to start. They're very walkable, very warm, friendly. They're open. They're not as crowded. And it's going to be really easy to get around and to get anywhere from those ones. Uh, the American standard tends to be the seventh. There are a lot of people that love the seventh. For me, it's a little bit too far from the action and a little bit too bougie personally, but that's me. And then, yeah, the I mean, when you get into the third or the second, you're getting into a lot of really good food, bars, like the restaurants. Those are the places that like you're starting to get into the territory that I love the most. And then once you get out of there, I can always direct you towards what I think are the best parts of the city. But if you're going to stay, I think that the first five are the best. The first five or six are going to be the best uh the best bet. That makes a lot of sense. Now, like you know, if, if people are you know trying to stretch their budget dollars or you know trying to find some hotels that are a little cheaper, whether it's points or cash, the lower the number is, the the more central it is. It is. So the way that the Ronis Mounts work is it goes one to 20 spiraling out from the middle. So if you wanted to try and stretch it a little bit more and you wanted to go to an area that was also like fun and, or at least, you know, safe and quiet, then I would say like the 14th and the 15th, are going to be great for that. Um, the 16th is very, it feels very upscale, lots of Osmanian buildings, just getting, it's also very far away. And the 17th as well is is like very residential, chill. All of those ones are going to be, I would imagine are going to be a little bit cheaper, especially like the 14th and 15th. And then you'll be able to hop on a Metro line without too much difficulty. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that people forget is that the public transportation is extensive throughout Paris. So even if you are staying a little further out, you just hop on a metro and get into the central part of the area, you know, in 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, it's it's great. And so I think the I think the thing is that the reason I say to stay in the center, obviously, if you want to stay farther out and to it will get cheaper if you get out into like the suburbs, um, just make sure you're staying very close to an RER station so you can get in quickly. And also I would double check, like don't just because something has the word Eiffel Tower in the name doesn't mean you can even see the Eiffel Tower from where it is. <laughs> There's a lot of false marketing in the way people name things sometimes. I would also double check like, oh, cool, Arc de Triomphe, something, something. I would look at a map and make sure that you actually know where it actually is before you commit to it. Absolutely. And like we were going to talk about with your profile, uh, look for people on social media, tourists or visitors, they're going to post pictures. And if you're looking at looking at the tags and looking at their, their accounts, you're going to see actual photos of the property and actual views from your room. And if somebody has a view of like the building next door, they're, they're going to show it to you. Yeah, for sure. Definitely don't trust the marketing materials of the the hotel or restaurant in question. Absolutely. So one last thing, what are like maybe three or four like restaurant recommendations that you would have for like a, either a unique Paris experience or just something that you wouldn't expect to find there in, in Paris? Yeah, I mean, I one of the reasons that I love this city is that it is far more multicultural and diverse than I think most people imagine. It's one of the most, if not the most diverse capitals in Europe. And there is just so much good food to eat here. So like, like there's a very strong connection to Vietnam here and the sandwich banh mi, if you're familiar. And if you're not, you should become familiar. One of my favorite banh mi's in the city is a, a place called Nanette. It is going to be a, a, a trek. It's off the beaten path, but it is worth it. It's on a great street, a party street, Jean-Pierre Tombeau, with lots of good stuff going on. But their sandwich, and then they've got little bone, uh, like, um, what would you call it? Uh, stuffed donuts. I was going to call them beignet, but I guess that works too, that are incredible. But their fried chicken, their fried chicken banh mi is super good. What else random? So, oh, if you're looking for a taste of home, we were talking about this before the show, but often people are looking for a taste of home. Uh, and I would say that like the smash burger scene here is kind of taken off. Don't trust anybody that just says they have a smash burger because like, it's the same thing. You're going to see people claim that they have tacos and they, what they're offering looks and is nothing like a taco. <laughs> um, similarly, you'll go to a restaurant and see a smash burger and they will just give you a hamburger because they don't know and they don't care. So if you're going to get a great smash burger, there are a couple of places that I really love but if you take my recommendation to go to Atelier de Lumière, to the, the light warehouse, I guess, go to Baby Love. Weird name, phenomenal burgers. Their fried chicken burgers are also super good. That's all they do is burgers. They don't do anything else. Burgers, fries, and then they do have soft serve in case you've got a kid along that really wants an extra. It comes in a little happy meal that they have. Baby Love burger is amazing. Right on. And now, um, obviously, if we're going to all the way to Paris, we want 
at least one one French experience there, right? Oh yeah, so then I had I, I, <laughs> I had it in my notes for you. Uh, Brasserie Dubio would be a really good one. So that's going to be a lot more central as well. So it'll be a little less work to get to, but they are a classic French bistro that's been modernized. Phenomenal uh, layout, interior. The service is usually great, and they offer a lot of different classics that you're gonna that you're gonna love. I in winter, their French onion soup is really good and then just anytime you want to get like a rotisserie chicken with fries or a puree it's 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 money oh fantastic right on well jay i really appreciate you coming to the show and sharing all these amazing tips for paris it's definitely helping my future trip making our planning a lot easier i'm sure it's going to help the listeners as well but now it's time for the final countdown if somebody only had time for one meal when they visited paris where should they go and what should they eat you have to go to currently rigmarole but look up dan pear on instagram my buddy dan makes and I kid you not, the literal best pizza in the world. And I am a, I have a pizza tattoo. Just to let you know how dedicated to the search for pizza I am, go to the rigmarole, have Dan's pizza. It will change your life. We may have been separated at birth. Uh, I don't have a pizza <laughs> tattoo, but like I literally eat pizza everywhere I go. So that it is there. I, I kid you not. It, I, I've taken multiple rounds of New Yorkers to it. None of them have left thinking they've eaten anything better. <laughs> nice, nice. Like you said, you've arrived in Paris. You headed off to, to Nice for a little while, and then you came back and just kind of fell in love with the city and basically planned everything to come back and uh, and have been here for for a number of years now. So during this time, I'm sure you've had some just incredible experiences. What's one of the most memorable? One of the most memorable that comes immediately to mind is the time that we lost my friend Gitu. <laughs> they, there, I when I moved here, I, I ended up hanging out with a bunch of people from Nice. The funny thing is that I didn't make any friends that were from Nice when I lived in Nice. And then when I moved to Paris, suddenly I was hanging out with a group of Niçois. And one of them was this very buttoned up, professional, great, very sweet human being. When we would go out with him, he would let loose. And there was he just had this skill. No matter where we were, we would end up going to these cheesy nightclub type places where you're spending 15 bucks for a pint of beer that didn't actually have alcohol in it, you know, that level of, of drinking. And yet somehow every time he would wander off into the crowd and come back having found somebody that had something much stronger and he was off to the rest of the night. And basically every time we got to about five or six in the morning, it was always the hunt for Gitu because he would just vanish and it would be between, it'd be between team us and team paramedics. And usually, usually we would find him first and get him home and he'd be all good to go. But there, <laughs> there was more than once, there was more than once that the paramedics may have won and we either had to reclaim him from them or just wait to hear how he was feeling after his hangover in the hospital. Like you literally described like the hangover, like the movie. They may have done that movie based on your experience. Unfortunately, well, or maybe fortunately, we never ran into Mike Tyson and never ended up on any rooftops. But aside from that, there may have been people in, yeah, in trunks. You never know. Yeah. Random babies. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm a father now. <laughs> right on. Well, speaking of good times and happy memories, where's the happiest happy hour in Paris? If you like drinking beer, I would go to the Pan Am Brewing Company because, I mean, there are a lot, there is an endless amount of options. I love going out in this city. I don't go out till six in the morning anymore. That was a decade ago. But Pan Am is, is a great one. They're a local brewery and their location is phenomenal. It's on the canal, which is another one of those things that most people are completely unaware exists in Paris. They have a phenomenal view looking straight down the canal. If you go there at sunset, you're going to get a wonderful sunset view with the Eiffel Tower peeking up just over the roof line in the distance. It's incredible. And it's one of those local, like truly Parisian places that is way off the beaten path, but not inaccessibly so. Oh, that sounds amazing. You know, having a great beer with great views and I'm sure there's a lot of great people inside. I mean, that's like the perfect combination. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, one of the things I always do whenever I travel is check out the local pizza. So obviously I have to go hang out with your buddy, Dan, to to get some pizza there, right? If you don't, I I will never speak to you again. (laughs) Obviously, you know, you traveled a lot coming from America to to Paris. You're you're doing everything on social media, explaining all the great tips for for travel. Uh, What's one of the best travel tips you can share with with the listeners? It actually goes back to what we were talking about earlier when you're visiting. I think a lot of people... When they travel to France in particular, they really want to practice their French, which I fully endorse. I think that's great. And I think you should do it. I think the one thing, however, would be we were joking about how when you say bonjour, they're going to know you don't speak French out of the gate. And there's a chance that they're just trying to get on with their day. So try not to be, if you can, try to prepare yourself not to be offended if and when they switch to English on you. Because a lot of people, I think, end up being very disappointed that 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 happens and it will happen a lot. 
and it's normal. And once you get to that point, the cool thing is it feels like such a huge milestone to reach when you have a conversation in French and it goes well and they never try to switch on you. That's a badge of honor that you get to earn. So I would say like go into it with the mentality that you're going to improve. You're going to learn. It's going to be great. You might find some people that are very gracious and willing to speak with you in French, but also try not to be, try not to take it too personally if they switch languages on you. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the things also when people are, are traveling, especially to something like Paris where it's, you know, it can be kind of expensive, right? For all the plane tickets and the hotels and everything like that is don't forget that you have to book some things far in advance in order to be able to to do them, right? So like one of the things that I really want to do when I'm when I'm there is the catacombs weren't open the last time we were there. And so now they've, they've opened in the last couple of years. And so that's an experience I really want to have. And if I wait to the last minute or wait till we arrive to book tickets, they may not be available, right? Or you're going to be paying a lot of money because you're buying them from a reseller or whatever. So you got to plan ahead on the things that like the really key things you really want to do and make sure you get those reservations. And that's true for most monuments. Now the Louvre everywhere is online. So you want to book online in advance they just might require you to do that depending on where you're going. And so if you know you want to go and you're a planner, then I would definitely do that in advance. And if you're not a planner, you're like going to wing it. As soon as you have the inkling, we might want to do this. I would definitely go book it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for us, when we were there in Paris the first time, we actually had, like somebody recommended we had to go to a little shop, you know, that's like a magazine or like cigarette shop. And that's where we got like the the pass that helped us skip the line to get into the Louvre. And now I don't even think that stuff's legit anymore because now everything's online. Yeah, everything's really changed a lot with all of that. And generally it's for the better. Like you know, everything really does work a level better than it used to with all of that. But it, I mean, it, like if you go to the Arc de Triomphe, for example, you can still, there's still a ticket office and people still line up to buy their tickets there. And you will feel like a total boss if you already have your ticket and you skip that entire line and just go straight up to the middle of the roundabout. It's like the line before the line before the line. Right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the French are not good at lining up either. So if you're with tourists, the line will probably be orderly. But that's another thing to be aware of when you come here, especially if you have any British listeners that have not been to France already. The French are notoriously bad at queuing. So um, <laughs> Don't feel bad if you want to point out to somebody, hey, get back in line. But at the same time, be aware that like if you're at a bakery, there is the the unwritten rule that you can skip the line if all you're getting is a baguette. So people will do that. So don't be too offended if you see somebody jump up and grab a baguette because they they are allowed to do that. One last thing on that. One thing that we really enjoyed is they actually offer discounts if you take if they do like take away, like instead of sitting down and eating at the restaurant, they will actually give you a discount if you just take the food and go. Yeah, that's said a lot of the a lot of bakeries will do that. And there are different places that will. I honestly that happens a lot less. And especially with the types of places that I recommend. It's that's actually something that I haven't run into in a really long time, but you're totally right. Well, it's good to know. Well, again, Jay, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing all these amazing tips. Can you tell the audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Jay Swanson, if you didn't pick up on that part already. And you can find me, my main presence is going to be on YouTube, where I have made an endless amount of videos about what to do and see in Paris. And then I also just share my daily life in Paris, if you'd like to see what that's like. I do that there as well as on Instagram and my newsletter. Absolutely. And then also you have an online guide for Paris. So if people are planning their trip, that's something they really want to check out as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And we actually put together a little discount code just for your listeners, if they're curious. Uh, If you want to go check out my guide, it's at parisinmypocket.com, which is also the name of one of the video series I've done, Paris in My Pocket. And then if you put in the code WETRAVEL15 at checkout, you'll get 15% off. And then it's lifetime access. And I'm updating it all the time. I'm literally always re-verifying and adding new places. And it's, it's, I'm really proud of it. Well, fantastic. And I appreciate the discount. I'm sure the, the listeners will appreciate it as well. So if people have more questions about your guide, about your YouTube series, or just anything about Paris in general, what's the best way to reach you on social media? Uh, I would say if anybody wants to reach out, you can always do so over on Instagram. It's at Jay Swanson, just the same as everything else. And that's probably the easiest way. Fantastic. Well, again, Jay, thanks for coming on the show. And we look forward to seeing you when we travel there. Dude, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I hope that your daughter has the best time ever and that your time is, you know, fine. (laughs) What an awesome conversation with Jay. I've been to Paris twice and really enjoyed the city and the people. And I can't wait to explore Jay's tips when I take my daughter there for the first time. You can find all the links we talked about today and our one page guide to Jay's tips at wetravelthere.com forward slash Paris. We want to say thank you to Bluffworks for being an affiliate partner of today's episode. Bluffworks offers many styles to fit your needs so that way you can save wrinkle free while traveling. 
go to wetravelthere.com forward slash bluffworks and use the promo code LEAD to save 10% off your order. Join us next time as we speak with my new friend, A-King Claudia Ann Akinde of tourismforever.cam. In this episode, we talk about seeing the animals at the Duala Idea Reserve, exploring the, the Kam Kam waterfalls, and buying local crafts at the Marche de Fleurs uh, local market. We hope you join us when we travel there. I love hearing your feedback about the show. Send me a tweet at We Travel There or email me at wetravelthere.com forward slash contact to share your thoughts. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share with your friends and tell me what you like most. Make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app. That way you won't miss any of our upcoming destinations. Mm-hmm.